but I, I don't like the lighting on me. I'm going to try to turn on some lights here. Okay, let's see. Oh. Yeah, that's better. It's gonna be kind of bright in my eye, but I guess I guess that'll work. So here we are, streaming week one, day three. Looks like audio's going okay. CPU is pretty high for some reason on this computer. So let's see if something's happening here. No, I think that's just what it's doing today. Okay, well, here we are. I'm gonna give people a minute to get online. As you're doing that, I'm gonna pull up a couple of things here in my browser. Get ready to talk through some topics and whatever else we need to. I'm gonna try really hard to make this one not as long, but I also don't wanna rush through things, so we'll see, right? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and log into UMW Domains here so that I can get into my WordPress dashboard. In fact, maybe I'll just go into my, go ahead and get logged into my dashboard. Well, there's an essay I would like for you all to look at, or an article. So I'm gonna pull that up. Pull out a couple of little things I wanted to show you related to that. Okay, well, oops, that didn't work. You can't see what I'm doing, but the thing I was just doing just now succeeded. Sort of. Oh, this is interesting. It broke. Huh. Oh, no, it didn't. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't, you can't see what I'm looking at yet, but I'm working on something I, wanted, I would like to show you all in a moment. Okay, great. So that's going. Uh, oh, nine viewers. Hello, welcome. Good afternoon. Still getting a couple things set up here. Let me see. I wanted to check something. Before I get started. Hope you're all doing okay. Figuring things out, getting your domain set up. By the way, related to your domains, a couple reminders. That's something that you should have by now. You should go to umw.domains and have you sign up. You should have a domain there. Uh, if you don't, then let me know so I can help you figure that out. Also, you should definitely be in Slack by now. You should have some some uh, presence there. <laughs> you should have should be able to access it. I suspect that if you're watching this, you are also already in Slack. But just in case you're you're not, um, I sent messages to a few of you yesterday that I haven't seen yet in Slack, so make sure you do that. Um, yeah, let's see. That's weird. It's not letting me click on that. trying to find a patent that I'm pretty sure exists, but I can't find it right now. So I'll have to look at it later, perhaps. Um, okay, so as you can see on the board, these are the things I want to try to talk about today. And I should probably add one more, which is that I want to talk about 
Well, I'll, you, I'll do these in order. I want to talk about your weekly reports. Your first one of these is due Friday. We are in the first week, and so that's something you should be preparing to complete by the end of the week. Along with everything else, the weekly report itself shouldn't be too much of a burden. It's not it, in itself is not particularly challenging, I think, but it's a, a way for you to be accountable to explain what you've been doing this week. So it is something you should do last, and it's something that you should take a few minutes with. And I'll talk about how to do that um, first. Uh, then I want to talk about the early history of the web or the prehistory of the web. And we'll, we're going to look at a few um, influential documents and learn about a few important people in this first couple of weeks of the semester. And we're going to start with an essay from 1945 called As We May Think, written by someone named Vannevar Bush, who was a research scientist. And he has some pretty interesting ideas about how we, that is humans, should organize ourselves and our society better with uh, the benefit of computers or, or electronics. At that time, he's not talking about computers because they didn't really exist as we think of them now. Um, but he has some ideas that are influential and actually give us some models for how we think about the web currently. So speaking of the web, I do want to tell you all about the digital creativity modules, explain your choices for that, and show you how to get started today. You should, should plan on getting started with that today. And then also um, the uh, work, some, some, some other things you can do with WordPress to continue setting that up. So by now, hopefully you've got a domain, you've got some way to create content. It's probably WordPress. If it's not WordPress, by the way, let me know so that I can tailor some instructions to you if you're using something else. Um, but I'm going to, until I hear otherwise, assume that everyone's working with WordPress for that. Okay, so let's get into, let me switch my scene over here we are um, and go into some uh yeah some some of this content so today i have the slack channel for the live stream still up over on the left so if you have thoughts and comments that you want to to that you don't mind appearing on the live stream and in the archive then you can put them there if you have things you'd rather send me privately you can dm me um or you can try to email me while i'm streaming but i might not see that in time so probably a slack dm is the best way to get in touch with me right now if you'd rather not be if you'd rather that not appear on screen um you can also use the twitch chat but of course that would appear on the the chat like on the twitch website if that's how you're accessing it so uh here's our course website our slack um, our canvas site and today we're going to be talking about the notes and things that are on week one day three so I've got that up here. Oops, I don't have it linked yet, but I will link to it. Um, I sent an announcement with a link to it, hopefully. So hopefully you saw it, um, but here it is now, and I will update the link on the outline page. Uh, but here it is, nice overhead view of the ocean that I found on Unsplashed. So this is, um, yeah, this is what we wanna do. I'm actually not gonna go to WordPress first, but that's listed here first. And these are some things that you can probably do on your own. And these instructions here are, hopefully clear enough, um, and there are links to other explanations if you need some more help with that. But I, I will take a look at that near the end of the stream today just to make sure you have another another way of getting that material. Um, oh yeah, I also wanted to talk about code of context. I keep forgetting these things. Okay, uh, but this is this is the content for today. So actually, let's, let's talk about briefly before I get into today's content. Uh, let's take a look at the weekly reports. The first one of these is due Friday at midnight along with everything else that's that's related to this week, which is the Hello World assignment and the Digital Creativity assignment. So uh, the weekly reflections and reports, we five of these, uh, they're pretty simple, I guess, or I hope they are. Um, the idea is that you think back on everything you did this week and talk about it. Um, you can do that in a blog post, but bear in mind that blog posts are public, so if you don't, if you have thoughts that you'd rather not share with the whole world, you maybe don't want to do a blog post. So, but you could write something and send it to me um, in Canvas. You could um, record a video. You can actually record it directly in Canvas, or you can record it on your own and upload it to Canvas, or you could re record it and share it in on your blog. I mean, there's lots of different modalities. Basically, anything you can think of, so long as what you're doing is reflecting on your work this week and accounting for what you what you accomplished. And uh, when we, I'll talk about the, this a bit more when we talk about the modules, but this isn't a class where it's about tasks and accomplishments uh, so much as it is about processes and learning about how you learn best as someone in this digital world. So um, I, I think I, I struggle with the phrasing here a bit, but I don't want you to think that this is, you have to have a checklist of I did this, 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 and this, and then I'm done. 
Uh, I think it would be better to say, I learned about these things and I discovered this. You know, use language that's more related to uh, process if possible. So yeah, I'm just double checking that I can, you can submit things there and you can't. So that's good. Sometimes I forget to uh, check those boxes. But that's it. Uh, you know, again, it's due midnight, so uh, midnight Friday. So if you have questions, let me know. But hopefully, pretty, uh, pretty well explained here. Um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me talk about the code of conduct next. This is something that uh, a couple of you did add to. So let me, at least one of you added to. So let me pull that up. Uh, so this content is um, and Becca, no. Um, I'll, add, uh, I'll just add that here. Um, uh, uh, trying to reply to you in the channel. No specific link, uh, just make it quote long enough. <laughs> That's what I always say when students ask me how long something should be. I always say it should be long enough, uh, which is I told you what it should accomplish. So just write it as long as you need to in order to accomplish those things. Um, I don't think an arbitrary word count really gives you a sense of whether something is long enough or not. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just think, you know, it varies widely. So uh, make sure that you're, make sure you're accounting for the things that you've done and, and being reflective about it. So that's about all I can say. Uh, okay, so something else I would like to invite you to contribute more to because it's just, there's actually very little here so far, is this uh, co code of conduct or terms of use. Um, and this is important because this is a document, a place where we can reflect on what it means to be this particular community this summer. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of blocking part of it, uh, but uh, it's, maybe I can, I don't know how to move that to the side, but uh, within the browser, but the, um, let me if I go this way, I don't know. Uh, but this is a document that I shared in the, in the Slack channel for code of conduct. So make sure you're in that channel, first of all, if you're not. And just like with any other channel, you can add to it. If you click on, uh, if you look at the channels on the left, I'm not going to pull up Slack now, but on the uh, where it lists the channels on the left, there's a plus sign next to the word channels. And when you click that, it lets you search for channels, including this one, which is code of conduct. Um, in fact, I'll just go ahead and link to it right here um, to join the code of conduct channel and share your suggestions. Well, suggestions isn't really the right word, but hopefully you'll see what I mean. So you notice what I did, I just typed hash code of conduct and that became a, a link to that channel. So if you just click that link in the um, in the, just the stream chat channel, you'll see the code of conduct. You will get to the code of conduct channel and you can join it. Uh, and then once you're in there, you'll see the link to this Google Doc. And I really like ML, I think that's Macy. I, I really like your contribution here. So uh, what I'm trying to do is come up with a, a set of, or describe a set of behaviors that will contribute to success, uh, both for you individually and then for us as a whole, as a class. And I keep using that inclusive pronoun there. Like I mean this as something we have to work towards here. So if there are things that you would like for me to make sure I do, you can, and there's a way to express it here, then that's certainly great. I mean, that's, that's certainly part of it. Uh, but I really liked um, ML's contribution, ask for help, like absolutely. Don't ever struggle alone in this class. You don't have to struggle alone. Um, and sometimes you will struggle. I mean, I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't know which challenges you will find more challenging, but I know that there will be something in this class that will push you, or I hope so. Um, and that's okay, that's on purpose, that's by design. But just because you're being pushed, just because you're being you know, uh, challenged or maybe outside, you're outside of your comfort zone, you know, that doesn't mean you should give up. Uh, you should definitely do it. I wanted to share uh, a comment from the spring section. Of course, the spring section of this class was totally disrupted, but I think, you know, all things considered, my students uh, did a great job uh, pulling it together. Um, and I think this class pivoted pretty well, I think due to the, mainly to the, the content area. But one student who really struggled said something like, this was uh, referencing a specific project. She said, this was, uh, this was really, really hard, but I realized that if it had been easy for me, then I would not have learned as much. So she recognized that that struggle was really what made it valuable. And that just, like that did such a great job of crystallizing the outcomes of this class and, and every class I teach really that I really, I really like that. In fact, I might pull out her quote and use that as a, 
epigraph on my uh, syllabus because it was so so perfect. So anyway, um, add, add some thoughts here. I can think of lots of other things, but I don't want this to be something I'm telling you. Uh, I want you to be generating this as much as possible. So things that will indicate success, right? So in this case, like I've mentioned something to avoid. Um, I think there's lots of other things that probably should be avoided and we should probably name some of those as much as we can. Uh, I think things like sexist or ableist language are things to avoid, for example. Um, so I, you know, if no one else contributes that, I certainly will. Um, but, you know, those are the kinds of things that I, I'd like for you to, to be thinking about and be aware of um, as you, you know, as you uh, think about your participation in this class. I realize some of you are doing this kind of asynchronously, so you might not see this video or, or, or uh, look at this until, you know, Friday or, or, or so on. So I'm not going to ask you all to like sign this document yet because I think people might might still be coming to it a bit later but I do want to, this to be something that we can all buy into and agree on so uh, please add your thoughts here uh, especially if you can think of things that we should encourage each other to avoid um, I think one that sometimes people feel differently about is unsolicited advice or critique so if you put your work out there many of you have been sharing your blog entries which is great um, and even, you know, complimenting each other's blog entries, which is great. Uh, but sometimes uh, I've seen a student try to be helpful and they say uh, they might offer a point of criticism. They, they might say, you know, your color scheme isn't that great or this doesn't look very good. Uh, sometimes critical <laughs> feedback is important, uh, but sometimes that's not delivered in a way that actually reaches the person um, where they need to be reached. And sometimes that can create tension and, and frustration within a class. So um, I don't know, how do you feel about unsolicited critique uh, or, or that kind of feedback? Um, how should we, um, you know, how should we approach that? Like one idea is that you have a, um, like a channel where you are by sharing things, like call it a critique channel or something. And there, therefore, when you put things in there, you're explicitly asking people to critique it. Um, that's, you know, that opens that option for people that, that do have more critical comments. I mean, that's an idea, but, um, you know, tell me what you think about that, especially the, the uh, uh, feedback idea. I will be giving you feedback. Some of it will be, I mean, I hope it's helpful, but I, I think you may find some of it uh, uh, critical. So that's the kind of thing where, you know, I want you also communicating with each other. So, uh, you know, how do you want to receive that feedback or how, how are, are there uh, ways linguistically that we can make sure that we're not stepping on toes or hurting feelings as we do that? Um, anyway, so uh, add those or any other thoughts, please do that. If you um, if you notice, like this is a Google Doc, sometimes people are shy about changing someone else's writing or editing it, um, but certainly feel free to add anything, kind of take a yes and approach where you agree with somebody but add something else as opposed to deleting it. But if you really want to engage with someone's ideas, you can always uh, highlight it and then add a comment if you want to engage with their ideas without actually adding to the document. But I'd like to see some action there and whatever, whatever your thoughts are. Uh, okay, so let's take a look then at this article here. This is an essay by Vannevar Bush, and um, I wanted to provide some context. It is linked in here. Um, hopefully, this is the right link. Let me let me just double check that that link works, and it does. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about it here, um, and then there's a Slack channel. Uh, I need to update that link um, for this, which I would like to invite you to contribute to as well. So let me update the link so that it works. Did I already add this one? I thought I did. But I guess, no it is already, well why am I not? Oh, there it is. Okay, there is a dis discuss dash bush um, thing and so I do see one person in there, great. So I need to update this um, link. I thought I already did this and someone found this one so they must have Maybe I updated it somewhere else. Uh, let me let me fix this and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, by the way, I did. Um, I don't know if I if I told you all I had a couple of complaints about Canvas and specifically their new text editor, which is what I'm using here. And uh, I shared my one of my crit criticisms to them, and they said they're going to try to fix it. So that's good. So, uh, but not, there's a different one that they are not going to, so <laughs> that's okay. 
the other one that they, the thing that really annoys me is I can't edit links in the sidebar of Canvas. And um, I, I just have a lot of uh, very limited you know, options I can do to customize this site to make it communicate to you the information that I want. Anyway, um, but they are going to fix this editor so it doesn't, so the, the scrolling and expanding thing is, is not as twitchy, hopefully. All right. So uh, let's talk then about uh, Vandivar and Bush. And I, I've linked to it here, and I would like your thoughts on it, but I want to give you an introduction to some of what I think are the big ideas. And I've got some questions here, and these are some questions that I would love to see you engage with in the Slack channel. Um, one thing that is going to be tricky, and it always is with Slack if you're discussing things asynchronously, is you might um, see all these and think, oh, this is great, I should write an essay. And then you write like a, a, a five paragraph essay, and then you copy and paste that all into Slack. Uh, please don't do that. If you have really extended thoughts, that could be a great blog entry. Uh, but if you just have some quick thoughts about these specific things, like how this device, the Mimex, is like Wikipedia, that could be a single little uh, message in Slack, and then people could respond to just that one. Um, I mean, that's something that's, that we'll, we'll kind of get used to negotiating as we go, but just an FYI there. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at, as we may think, and uh, like I said, I'm going to take you through some of the big ideas here in discussion, but um, I also hope that you read it and we'll have your own thoughts. Um, now, you might notice that mine is yellow, or it's very yellow. Um, when I talk about one of, like, some of the devices or, or concepts that this essay inspired, uh, there's a relatively recent device or option or thing um, called Hypothesis, Hypothesis, and it's, the website is hypothesis.is, and um, it's a web annotator, so you can annotate any website, and they actually talk about the Mimex as inspiring or as like the model for what they're doing here. Um, so they will sometimes, when they demo Hypothesis, they'll use this essay to demonstrate what Hypothesis can do. So all these yellow things that you see here are highlights from Hypothesis. Hypothesis is a plugin for Chrome, and you can also access it if you go to this, if you do it like, I don't know if you can see on the stream, but um, this is the URL, it starts with HTTPS, www.theatlantic, all that. In front of that, I stuck in this URL, via.hypothesis.is, and then that loads the hypothesis sidebar, which is this thing over here on the right. And um, let's see, I'm gonna make sure that's in the shot. I feel like I'm, I think I need to adjust my OBS window slightly because I'm not showing you everything that I mean to. Let me see if I can get that in here a little better, or maybe, what if I do this? Lots of things to kind of resize. That's, that, yeah, that's better. Okay, so this is, um, this is it. So over on the right, you can see where people have added comments so that you, well, you select something and then with hypothesis enabled you, you annotate it with something. And that idea of annotating or adding a, a, a comment is what what uh, Mimex is actually all about. So I, I very often when I assign this essay, I do ask students to use Hypothesis to annotate it. I'm not asking you all to do that because, um, as you can see, there are now hundreds of comments on this article and it's becoming kind of overwhelming and I think it's actually difficult to read now because of that. So I'm actually going to turn Hypothesis off, but I just wanted to mention it because I find it a very to be a very useful tool and uh, we may find some structured way to use it later on in this class. But for now, let's just look at the uh, the article. Um, I don't want that. So, okay, so let's set, this, set the stage a little bit. Vannevar Bush is a scientist working in the Defense Department in, during World War II. And World War II was the context that created a lot of the early things that we think of as computers now. Um, specific tasks like um, uh, calculating ballistics trajectories, like doing complicated math very, rel relatively quickly. Um, uh, that was one use, but a, a major use was uh, cryptography. So trying to create codes and, and try to break other codes, uh, but particularly between the US, uh, the UK, and Germany. Um, that was a big area of innovation for computing and a good and a, uh, an opportunity to develop these things. So uh, in 1945, as the war effort, as the war is ending, um, there, the, uh, Vannevar Bush, who was one of these scientists and engineers really working on this, um, in this area was interested in um, trying to take the momentum around computing and machinery at that moment in World War II and then figuring out what to do next with it. And I think that the title of this essay actually says a lot. It's an article in, this, in the magazine called The Atlantic 
and it's as we may think. And he is proposing an idea, a future, where we may think a certain way or a different way by um, through the aid of, of a device. As he says here, consider a future device. And that's what we're that's what he does in this essay. He goes through and kind of solves the problem of what do we do with this stuff? And um, here's one way we could do something with it. It's very uh, optimistic, very utopian in certain ways, but also kind of strangely uh, a product of its time in other ways. Uh, one aspect of it being a, prop, a product of its time is that the technology that he bases this on is not digital computing as we think of it, because that didn't exist yet. It's not micro microprocessors because those didn't exist yet. It's all microfilm. And I don't know if you've ever used microfilm or microfiche. Um, it's fascinating. It's actually really fun to use, I think. Um, but it's um, it's not computers. You can't do like full text search. It's basically tiny little pictures of each page of a newspaper. And you can zip through them very quickly. Um, but you have to really know what you're looking for to, to actually find something quickly. Uh, so that, that's he's working with what he has on hand. Another aspect of the datedness of this essay is evident actually in this little part here. I, I didn't mean to scroll to this, but it is the, it is the next example I was going to talk about. Um, if you notice, he talks frequently here about the work of science and the work of the researcher. Um, he is um, consistently, he consistently genders the scientist as masculine. So the, the scientist and the researcher is almost always a he or his uh, using the pronouns. And, and yet, women do show up in this. Uh, when they do, though, it's this, it's, they're not women, they are girls. And if you notice, they're doing, uh, they're doing the work behind the scenes to run the thing that the scientist is actually like, in control of and in charge of. So there's definitely a hierarchy of labor uh, in his vision of the future. Um, you know, again, kind of like the microfilm, you could say it's a product of its time. Uh, but it's also a way to think about the web now. Like how how is the labor of the web now organized, and is gender um, a, an aspect of that organization still? Uh, I would argue that it is, but that's a bit a bit much to get into today. Uh, but notice how he uses, and the language is almost creepy actually. Once you notice this, right? That there's he's talking about a voter machine, um, and that's the like a, a a robot voice kind of thing, uh, very early kind of synthesizer. And you notice it's not it, it's. He doesn't say who this woman is, but he says a girl stroked its keys. Um, and then again, she's there's another girl uh, stroking the keys of a stenotype machine. So, it, you know, it's kind of this idea of this girl stroking keys. To use that phrase twice is kind of strange. And then there's other places where girls in the back room are, are manipulating the files. It's 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 interesting, right? It's, um, it, it's something that we would call problematic, I think, today. But it's something that, um, you know, definitely is part of what we're, we're reading here. So uh, the big thing, though, and what we're interested in this for is this idea of the mimics. I'm trying to, I'm scrolling up and down because I'm trying to find the picture of it. To see if you can, I'm not actually sure if this version of it on the website has the picture or not. Uh, I guess not. So let me just Google that real quick, or DuckDuckGo it. Um, so there we go. So here's his. Uh, oh yeah, there's that. I want to look at that one too. Um, so this is the Mimex, and I want to take a look at that. There's a couple of different versions of this diagram. Oh, someone made it? I always think somebody should try to make this. It looks like here's an actual realistic looking model of it, so maybe someone's actually going to try to make it. Uh, okay, but here's a, here's a, it's a blurry picture, but it's a, a picture of the, the device. Uh, we're looking inside a diagram of a desk. So uh, let me switch it on my OBS view so I can see what parts I'm pointing at. So this part here, this is the insides of it. So you wouldn't see this. You would be sitting, so this is the desktop. And then you have these buttons here. This is great, I can point to the different parts of it. And then you notice you've got three screens. <laughs> what? Uh, there's some, some phone phone in here. Oh, it's not me. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just pointing out different things on my, the picture that I'm in front of right now. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay, so this is so this is the machine. And so you can see there's actually two. Uh, it's like a dual monitor setup for uh, for a screen, and then there's a third screen over there. And then there's all these are the keys. Like so, these would be the buttons that he'd be pushing. And then these I think would have like a pen device you could write with a stylus on these. 
And the whole idea of the MemEx is that it's about connections. It's about taking something from, uh, I love this pointing, it's taking something from that document there and then uh, attaching it to some part of this document here and saying that this is some meaningful relationship. Um, and that's the work of research to him. That's the work that the researchers are able to do now with the, the relatively small scale of this technology. Um, and that's the right thing to do right now, he says, to solve the problem of information, which is, is exploding at this point in the history, 1940s. Information is everywhere. There's too much. And so we need a new way to figure out how to do things with that. Um, oh, I made it even bigger. So now you can see the... Yeah, there's the keyboard, um, and then there's the screens. So yeah, you can imagine this as a workstation, um, but it's got all this stuff built into it, and it's uh, yeah, it's pretty cool actually to think about, you know, what it, what it would take to actually build this, which is why I'm kind of curious if someone has. You can certainly make a digital simulation of it. Um, someone's probably done that, but uh, actually physically constructing the desk for this, I think, would be a pretty fun carpentry project. Uh, okay, so there is another device that he mentions in this that I think gets a little less attention, but it's something that um, uh, that I think he calls it a walnut camera. So let me see if I can pull it up here. Yeah, this this device is another one that he describes in this essay, and I think it is pretty dorky looking, and I that that's why I like it. Um, it's something though that I think gives us a better maybe a metaphor for the kind of thing he's describing here. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell, but you've got this guy, this researcher here, you can tell he's a researcher because he has glasses and he looks serious and he's a man, according to uh, Vannevar Bush's, you know, gendered uh, division of labor. Um, but he's got a camera on his forehead. Uh, looks about the size of a GoPro, maybe a little smaller. And he describes this in the essay. There's like a little wire. You can kind of see if I can let me get my monitor back. If you can see there's a little wire running off the side and that's going down to a little bulb that he can squeeze whenever he wants to take a picture. Then that's recorded in microfilm that he can load up on his Mimex later. So um, I, I like this one because it's an even more direct metaphor for what he thinks the relationship is between uh, human intellect and the augmentation of human intellect. Like in other words, what machines are adding. And here it's something that it's not, it's an extra eye, like it's, it's taking what our eyes do, but doing something more with that modality of capturing an image and uh, recording it somewhere else. Similarly, the Mimex device, its nature is to augment what our brains are already doing with information, he argues, uh, and just doing that at a scale that's um, bigger and more connected because of the uh, relative affordability of this technology at that time. Uh, so that's something that I want, to, I want us to keep in mind, that the Mimex is not totally radical. It doesn't come out of nowhere. He's arguing that this is how our brains work. We form associative chains of connection between one idea and the next idea and the next idea and the next idea. So let's have a device that does that too. Uh, that's his That's his whole argument. Um, it was like the way it worked, it just was impractical to build and probably would still be very impractical to build. Uh, but it's something that he thinks makes sense because it's, you know, it's how our brains work. And that's his real innovation here is to see that this is a thing we can do with computers and it's a way to solve the problem of information. Like right now, if you don't know what you're looking for, as I said with the microfilm, you, you may never find what you're looking for. You may never, never, it may never occur to you to look for certain things e either because the list of things to look for is simply too big. Um, but think about how easy it is to find things now because of uh, the way the web has connected us through information. And that connection, that's the thing that he was talking about in 1945. It's just something that we take for granted today. Uh, we take it for granted so thoroughly that it's, it's difficult to imagine an alternative. It's difficult to imagine um, what what we would do without it. Um, it's difficult. I always have a hard time explaining to my kids like things like, uh, I mean, how TV works or how, how it used to work or, um, you know, how the card catalog system worked, um, that, that kind of thing. You had to know what you're looking for so you could look it up and then find the number that, that related to the position on the shelf. And then you could go look for it and hopefully find it. Uh, excuse me, but now everything's already connected in so many ways that we don't have to do that extra step, and that's great. Uh, but it means that we, you know, we need to still understand how we got here, and that's 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 what the Atlantic article here hopefully helps us do. Uh, so take a look at it, especially take a look at um, is it section seven. I think section seven is is really where he describes the key parts of this, and it's towards the end. It's kind of a long essay, but. Definitely take a look at it, especially sections, yeah, like five, six, and seven are really where he talks about 
the actual constructed, like the way the memex would work. And that really gives you some insight here. Um, this idea of what he talks about as paths, uh, that's something that we have kind of inherited and we still think of in computers as a path or, or a connection of links, a way of linking two documents or a series of documents. It is different. I mean, he talks about paths being uh, symmetrical. So two documents are connected and the path connects both of them. Both documents are aware of each other, so to speak. Um, that's not how links work on the web. It's just impractical to do it that way. But um, we, have, we do have those trails and we do connect them. Um, he even talks about the idea of pathfinders or people who can make good connections like that being a new branch of science. And you could argue that that's kind of like what, what a blogger is, like somebody who's making connections and, and sharing them. Like that's what we're, what we're doing. So it's a fascinating essay, um, problematic in certain ways, as I said, but an interesting insight into ways of, of thinking. And that's really what the web is about. Um, I put this essay at this point in the semester because I want you to think about the web not just as a tool to use, but as a, a way to think about um, human thought and, and our minds and how we are affected by all these things. And this is something that has radically changed how we think of ourselves and think of each other. Um, and I think we can't ignore that. So this is, what, this, is a, this is an essay that gives us an early insight into some of those ideas. Uh, again, take a look at it. I think it's a fascinating essay. Uh, we, we will continue to look at earlier, other like early or pre-web uh, ideas like this one. So they will be built off of each other. So make sure you get, at, at, at a minimum, make sure you get the, the basic ideas of the Memex uh, down in terms of how it works. And taking a look at the uh, notes for today, uh, make sure you uh, spend some time in that Slack channel contributing to a conversation about it. Uh, I mean, there are some, some questions I'm raised here that, that I've raised here that I, I've kind of answered just now. Um, but you, you, you may have your own take on that, so make sure you share that take. Um, either in, You can do it in the Slack channel, or if you want to do it in, a, in your own blog entry, that'd be fine. Just maybe share your blog link in our Slack channel. That's another way to, to keep building links, right? Okay, so how am I doing on time? Okay, yeah, I should, this is good. This is a good time to transition. So let me see, what else did I want to talk about today? So uh, yeah, I definitely want to talk about digital creativity, so let me work on that next. And then with any time left, uh, go ahead and talk about some WordPress things. Let me go back in here. So this, oops, not that one. Can't see, but I got multiple windows here. So this is the, so I'm going to go to the assignment page first. Hope everyone's doing okay, by the way. I haven't seen any questions for a bit, but if you have questions, let me know. So digital creativity is the first um, what I call module, and this is the assignment page in Canvas, but the information for these modules and the content is actually going to be uh, elsewhere, and I messed up that link. Yeah, this is the thing that I told Canvas was a problem, but uh, they haven't fixed it yet. Uh, let me fix this. I'll fix this while I'm talking. So modules are hosted actually on a different website. I save that change. And Smith had a question in Slack, so let me answer that before I uh, Sure, you can if you want to. Um, that's a, a good use of your blog. And a minimum, though, make sure you contribute. Conversations here in Slack. Now, if you do blog, of course, um, that gives you lots more room to write your thoughts, add images, links to things, um, and so that that is a uh, a much more comfortable way of, of responding for a lot of people. So I, I definitely recommend it. Um, if you do that, you can share your link to it back here in in Canvas, and I'll make sure to show you how to do that uh, before I wrap up today. Um, so this is, but this is the. Is this seriously not? Why is that not changing? I keep trying to change the title of this link and it's not changing. I am frustrated. <laughs> Sorry. It's not weird internet stuff. That's not what I want it to be. Watch, so options. Let's change that to digital audio. It didn't change. 
All right, so great, I get to write another bug report. Um, okay, so this is, <laughs> Um, this is, I just changed the link. So the, the reason I changed it is because the the weird internet stuff module is kind of awkward. It's, it's not great. Like it's something that I think people struggle trying to figure out what to do with it. So I've updated the list of recommendations now to replace that with the digital audio one. So while I'm doing that, let me show you what this is. So DTSD101.net is a common website that everyone who teaches DTSD101 at UMW uses, and we publish this out on the web uh, for anyone else to use. And we we do know of other schools where people sometimes use it. Um, so we we think of this as a replacement for a textbook. It's an open access text, basically. And it's a lot, really a lot of links to other things. Um, but I think it's really useful uh, for that reason, really valuable. Um, so we have, oh, here's digital audio right now. So we have, uh, I am working on a better version of this site, but uh, this one does still work here. So let me get this link updated before I forget. And see all these clicks? It should not take this many clicks to just update a link. On canvas, get it together. Okay, so let me see here. So uh, let's take a look at digital audio first. And there are more modules, more creativity modules on djst101.net. However, I would really like for you to choose one of these four because I want you to have some some friends. <laughs> I want you to have some colleagues working on the same module as you. And if you all, if I gave you the big list and you all chose different ones, you might not have anyone else that you were working with. Um, that may still end up being the case, but it's less likely if there are fewer to choose from. So please choose from one of these four modules. I'll talk about each of these, um, and uh, and then then you'll you'll be good to go. Okay. So each of these, uh, these are creativity oriented modules. These first four. This is what we're doing this week, and each of these has some specific domain of creativity um, where that domain is constrained technologically or through modality. So we're talking about this one first. This is digital digital audio and uh, this is where you know the, the opening part here just describes different ways that audio is digital. Um, and then um, down here there are some suggested uh, goals, things that you should try to accomplish in completing this module. Uh, this materials, these are some links to things. Uh, this is a podcast. These are some other things here. Um, and then these are some tools you might use in creating digital audio works. And here are some, some suggested tasks. So um, students have done uh, very pretty much all of these things. Sometimes people will actually uh, edit uh, audio, like edit music, like make a beat track and then add some instruments to it or something like that in uh, GarageBand. Uh, a lot of students who choose this module will do something around podcasting. And there are some tools here that explain, th there's some explanations of how to do it here. Um, there are some tools here that will help you do that. Audacity is probably the tool that most people use for this in terms of the basic recording uh, and editing, so that's what I recommend. Uh, but there's a, these are all suggested tasks. Um, I want to be clear about the suggested part of this because these are suggested. Uh, this, these are not required. You don't have to do all of these. You don't have to do any of these. Um, really, you're, you're working towards these goals with whatever, uh, with, with whatever tasks you think will help you accomplish that and demonstrate that you've accomplished that. So the idea is explore the significance of sound and technology, compose digital audio. Uh, these are things that you can do with each of these tasks, but you might have another way of doing those things as well. Um, you might do this one and find, okay, that was easy. That took me 10 minutes. Let me try this other one. Um, I want you to see you spend your time well on this, uh, bearing in mind that we just have a couple of days. Normally this would take two weeks, um, but with just a couple of days, what can you do in terms of digital audio if you choose to work on digital audio? And here's uh, certainly some suggestions. Now, if you do want to join, uh, if you do want to do this module, you should join the digital audio channel. This link is actually for the uh, spring semester Slack channel, and I will need to update that. But if you would like to join join it now, if you go to Slack and then click on plus channels, you can find the digital audio channel, or just you know, here's the digital, I'll just type it in the Slack. Um, here's the digital audio channel. So if you um, if you know you want to work on digital audio, go ahead and join that channel right now. Uh, likewise for the others. So let me talk a bit about another one. Let's talk about creative coding. Creative coding is my favorite thing. Um, it is something that I do and, and uh, I, I enjoy doing. Um, I'm teaching a class on creative coding this summer in the second term. So if you are interested in creative coding, you should definitely take that class because I don't know when I'm going to get to teach it again. So you should take it this, uh, this summer. Um, so uh, when we're talking about creative coding, we're talking about using code, writing programs uh, for no other purpose than to be creative. 
So the kinds of things you can do with that are the kinds of creativity you can do in all kinds of other contexts, like write poetry. So let's write some code that generates poetry or write a novel. So let's write some code that will generate a novel or create abstract images. So let's generate some of those. Um, so this is an example of a digital poem by someone named Nick Montfort in, in, the, in the world of digital uh, uh, creative coding with respect to poetry. Nick Montfort is kind of the go-to um, guy for that kind of thing. Uh, but you can do all kinds of other things. I've done quite a few Twitter bots, for example, and I haven't done any lately, but this image that you see here was generated by one of my Twitter bots. Um, you can check it out if you go to twitter.com slash crooked cosmos. Um, I got the name from a band name generator because I couldn't think of anything else. Um, but what it does is it applies a glitch art method called pixel sorting to images of outer space. And the parameters are ram randomized, so I never know exactly what I'm going to get. Um, and it just runs automatically every few hours. Um, I don't supervise it at all. It just runs and people interact with it and they seem to enjoy it. Uh, oh, that's a good one. You just, you kind of never know what you're going to get. And I really like the curtain effect on this one. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. So I didn't, I mean, I, I created the situation for this, but I didn't actually make decisions about this particular artifact. I just ran, you know, the, the bot just ran the code and ended up producing this. So that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. Um, another, so my, this is probably my favorite Twitter bot recently that I've made. It's called Auto Imagist, and it's based on Imagist poetry, like William Carlos uh, Williams, like the, um, um, the, the red wheelbarrow type of poetry that's super small poetry, um, super small poems. And what I've done here is it uses uh, a Microsoft AI to take a look at images, try to generate a caption for that image, and then I, I have it look at two images, two completely unrelated images, and then write a poem by combining a description of one image with a preposition and then the description of the next image. So it's a pretty simple concept, but I just, I love the outcome often. Uh, so here's like, um, look at this, right? I mean, this is beautiful. <laughs> um, a young boy wearing a red shirt, holding a pink umbrella over an insect on the ground. And, and I mean, that's a poem. I mean, it's, it's, it's an images poem because like of how strongly visual it is and how significant it tends to be. I can't, <laughs> sorry, my neighbor is. No, I haven't seen him, sorry. <laughs> That was my, my son's friend looking for him. Um, so the, anyway, so I just really like that. I can show you how to do these kinds of things if you're interested in creative coding. Um, if not for the module, then maybe for the class because, you know, it's a great class. Um, uh, anyway, the, the other one that I've, the other Twitter bot I've made that I am, I guess, fairly proud of, but it's certainly my most popular is based on the HGTV show uh, House Hunters. And as you as you may know with that show, there is a, a running joke where people have sometimes implausible sounding budgets for the houses that they're looking for. And so this just generates budgets and ridiculous jobs. So uh, these are all random. Some of these are dumb. Actually, I, all of them are dumb, uh, but some people really enjoy them. So that's, that's great. Um, like I founded a startup for walruses and I'm a koala repairer and our budget is $2.5 million, right? So very simple and very silly. And, and it's literally the same joke over and over again um, for how many times now are we up to? I don't know, tens of thousands of, of uh, no, no, okay, 5,000, uh, 5,105 um, versions of it. Uh, goes every few hours, 15,000 followers. So <laughs> you never know what's gonna be a hit. Uh, it took me like a, a couple hours to code it. Uh, but this is the kind of thing where, you know, this is digital creativity, right? Like this is something that you can do with that. Uh, okay, so I want to, I don't want to go too long. So let me talk kind of quickly about a couple more. Interactive fiction is great because if you're a writer interested in writing, this is a good thing to try to stretch your writing. So interactive fiction is fiction where clicking on something or typing something makes something happen. And most people choose Twine for this. And so I'll show you Twine. Uh, Twine is a... Um, a very accessible digital writing platform that lets you create linking stories. And whenever you go to the website, which is twinery.org, you are given examples of Twine games. And I'm trying to see if there's one that looks, oh, this one's really good. This is actually a really unusual one, so I don't know if it's the best demonstration, but I'll take a look at it. Um, so 
Yeah, this is actually, this is a good one. Okay, so th this is an example of a Twine game. Um, you typically will read text and then have some part of it that you click on. Um, this is an unusual one because it's, it's actually just you climbing a wall. Um, but as you find out, there are unusual things about the wall and, and about who you are and, as you climb. Um, so yeah, this is maybe not the, the most typical work, but a good example of the basic like idea of what, uh, what Twine is as you climb. Uh, clicking, clicking, clicking. So when you want to create something in Twine, here's all you got to do. So go to Use Online, and I would actually, well, back up, sorry. I would actually recommend downloading it instead of using it online. When you use it online, it actually does not save your stories. So you want to make sure to export them from the online, what you think of as the online version here. Um, sometimes people have lost work because they didn't realize that. So I would recommend downloading it so it's already on your computer. But this is how we do it. Um, demo a story. Uh, there is a bit of code in this, but it's, it's very minimal. So let me show you how this works. Start and then back, I'd say backyard. So we're starting to see it's in the backyard because I'm looking out over my backyard right now. So you are looking, you are, let's imagine that you are my neighbor, Corey. <laughs> you are in uh, Angel's backyard looking for him. He could be in the front yard or maybe the shed. He better not be in the shed, but these are places where you could be. And so what you do to make it make these locations is you type this notation, you do the, the square brackets, so you see there's two opening square brackets and then two closing square brackets. And I'm gonna do a couple here as well. And that's all I need to do to now make those locations. Now these are locations. Um, he's not in the front yard. The shed is locked. <laughs> uh, so it actually is not locked, but it probably should be uh, because that's where the chainsaw is. So this is uh, this is now a story that's interactive and we can click on it. You're in Daniel's backyard looking for him. He could be in the front yard or maybe the shed. Let's check in the front yard. Uh, he's not in the front yard. Uh, let's check in the shed. Uh, the shed is locked. So if this were an actual game I would, or an interactive story, I would have something here now to maybe look for the key or look elsewhere for Daniel, right? There's different things you could do. But this, you, hopefully you saw how easy and quick it is to create something with that. I think many writers are impressed with how quickly you can create something with interactive uh, in, in interactive fiction. So it's a good choice for that. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to go through and demonstrate things for the animated GIFs module. It is, I should tell you, the most popular um, when I do the face-to-face -face version of this class by far. Um, everybody wants to make animated GIFs. And the thing that I would just recommend with this, there are lots of recommendations and suggestions. Again, you don't have to do all of them. But the main thing is, um, you know, challenge yourself. Like, don't just make one GIF, maybe make a bunch of GIFs. The, the ways that you can make GIFs now have gotten a lot easier. Uh, it used to be pretty hard, and so it used to be a pretty significant challenge to work through GIMP or Photoshop to make a, a, GIMP, a GIF by hand. And certainly students have done that. Um, really excellent work, actually. Uh, let me see, maybe I can show you one. Um, oh, no, um, trying to think of, hey, what's up? Yeah, so I'm gonna show you an example of a student who, this is last semester, who created uh, some animated GIFs. I hope she's got them on her website still. Maybe not. <laughs> Come on, Olivia. So um, she she actually did a stop motion animation. Um, I don't know where it is, but anyway, um, she made some really cool little stop motion animations. I don't have them pulled up on hand here uh, using a clay. Paper. The um, other one I wanted to show you, Jessica. Uh, is another student who made animated GIFs, and she used animated GIFs to tell a story of a trip to Cuba. And I thought it was a great use of the medium. So hopefully she's got this on her website. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah. So everybody, uh, students all reorganized their websites in the last week of the class. So sometimes finding things. There we go. Um, sometimes finding things takes me a minute. Um, so let me see here. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I really like these because what she she took videos that she already had, and um, 
then she made looping animated GIFs from those videos. And what's great about these is that these are just kind of little moments of this trip she took. And they aren't like everybody posing and smiling. They're just little, almost trivial moments. But, you know, looping GIFs lets you spend a little time in that moment and recall what it's like to be there. And I think that captures uh, the feeling and the experience of this trip in a much richer way than just a, a photo album would. So I really like her work in this uh, on this module. You know, she's found something that was you know, deeply personal and connected to her, an experience she had, and she used animated GIFs to share that experience uh, and, and remember it. And it's something that we can now uh, participate in a little bit as well. We can kind of see what it's like to be there. So that was a really great uh, example of, of what you can do with animated GIFs. So anyway, choose one of those modules and uh, join the channel for that module and start, um, start working on it. Uh, you've got a, just a couple days, so uh, that's uh, that's it. So, all right, this has gone on long enough. I'm gonna need to wrap it up, but um, yeah, it's oh, 55 minutes. Goodness. So I talked about the weekly reports and Van of our Bush and the Mimex and digital creativity. Oh, I'm pointing the wrong way. Um, digital creativity. Uh, I didn't get to talk much about or at all about WordPress, but I did want to show you that. My intention was to do that, so I will make sure to do that tomorrow. Uh, some of that's just common sense setup for WordPress, and then a couple of it is, is a little bit more is like how to um, how to create content and, and create good content for the web, basically. So we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Uh, but I do want to wrap it up here. This is going on long enough, so I, so I can uh, upload it on YouTube next. Um, so if you have any quick questions or things you want me to, to answer while I'm still online uh, on the stream, go ahead and do that. Um, or go ahead and ask while, uh, well, actually, you know, I'll just leave the stream going for a minute while I, I need to update, I, do, I, I need to update the Slack links on djst101.net. So I will kind of keep the stream going while I'm doing that. But if you don't have any questions or anything, you're welcome to tune out at this point. Um, I just need to, you know what, actually I need, it's on my other computer. Flip over here to get on, and there he is. There's my son. <laughs> Looks like Corey found him. There they go. Yep. My son and Corey are, are hilarious together because my son is kind of small for his age, and Corey is kind of big for his age. <laughs> so between the two of them, it's kind of like we call him like. Um, it's like Han and Chewie, or like uh, Robin Hood and Little John. Uh, they're just they're they're getting all kinds of trouble. Oh, okay. I'm gonna have to go in a minute, but they are looks like they're trying to climb the fence. So this is uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just updating something that will make those links a little easier to work with if I can remember. Content templates. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so that should fix that link. Should fix those links. Let me double check and then no questions here and I need to go, it sounds like. Um, so I'll just wrap this up in a moment. But what I'm going to show you is hopefully that if you click on the link here in the module page, it'll take you to the right Slack channel. Why is nothing happening? Hmm. What is not happening here? What happened to my href link? Uh, okay, something's 
screw right here. Oh well, I'll fix it later. Uh, I, I have to go. There are some people with some problems that need solving. So um, anyway, uh, I will see you all tomorrow for one more stream this week. Otherwise, you know, keep working on things. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for watching. Bye.